Well, uh, we're going to be talking about, as Jody br mentioned briefly, we're, and Scott mentioned, we're from the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, and that's the URL, inderf.org. Uh, and as Scott mentioned, we'll be talking about some evidence of the afterlife, the latest, like literally just a few weeks old, groundbreaking new findings from the largest near-death experience ever reported. So hang on to your hats. We're going to have to go fairly quickly here. Um, the When I wrote my, oh, by the way, I'm, that's a couple of books that I've written. Heck, you don't need to buy my books. I'll tell you everything you need to know here in this uh, succinct presentation. But my first book was many years ago, Evidence of the Afterlife, the Science of New York, uh, of Science of uh, Near-Death Experiences. Within eight days, it was a New York Times bestseller, and immediately that changed my life. Good grief. I uh, ended up on the NBC Today Show three times, The O'Reilly Factor, Dr. Oz Show a couple times, uh, CBS, History and National Geographic Channel, and I was even honored to talk about my research at the New York Academy of Sciences. So it's been a great adventure and actually a lot of fun talking about my research over the 20 years that I've been working on it, and uh, exciting also to share the most recent research that I have with you this evening. So just so we're all on the same page, uh, for the purposes of the research I do, and I recognize there's different I, concepts of a near-death experience and different death definitions, but for my research, I considered a near-death experience to be uh, your near-death. In other words, as the name implies, so physically compromised that you're unconscious or even clinically dead with an absent heartbeat. Now, at that time, you're unconscious and, and should not have any possibility of a lucid or organized experience. You do. You have the experience part of the near-death experience, and I'm sure you've been hearing that all through this conference here. Now, no two near-death experiences are the same, but as you know from this conference and many other sources, there's a very consistent pattern of, of elements, characteristics, what occurs during a near-death experience. And I have some great news. We don't need to go through all 12 of these because I'm sure those listening are intimately familiar with, but these are the elements. Uh, other people have found even other additional elements beyond this, but this is what occurs during a near-death experience, uh, typically in a very consistent order. So that's the uh, near-death experience elements. Well, the, uh, I, I first heard about near-death experience about 30 years ago when I was in my residency training studying to be a radiation oncology physician. Back in that era, we had bound books. We didn't have internet. Um, yeah, that ever date me. Anyway, I was looking through the uh, Journal of American Medical Association, a prominent journal for a cancer-related article, and completely by accident had an article with the term near-death experience in it. I was immediately fascinated. And so I read the article and thought prophetically, geez, uh, this is incredible. This, this is true. It'll change my idea of the universe we live in. So some years later, after we set up the NDERF.org website, that started the over 20 years of research I do. I want to emphasize that our NDERF.org is a public service uh, devoted immediately from its inception to researching near-death experience with a detailed survey. And remarkably, over the 20 years we've been working on this, we have over 3,500 near-death experiences investigated and posted on the website so that anybody can read them in the words of the near-death experiencer. Now, going through this, please keep in mind that from the point of view of science, it's a basic tenet that what is real is consistently observed. And I would submit to you, as remarkable as the evidence is I'm presenting, it is overwhelmingly consistently observed. Huge thanks to Jody. So even though she's a licensed attorney, her full time, actually full time and a half job is to maintain the inderf.org website, handle the myriad amount of things that are associated with it in a flood of email that we get regularly. So huge thanks to Jody, whose efforts allow this uh, research and talk to be presented. Well, I wanna point out that when we talk about research and near-death experience, I'm certainly not alone. There have literally been hundreds of prior scholarly articles in some of the world's leading medical and scientific journals. And of course, as you noted throughout this conference, a great many uh, very important books too, also with important comments about near-death experience. Now, much of what I'm gonna be presenting today is corroborated by prior scholarly research. So again, I'm not a lone wolf. This is what many people are seeing. Okay, attention, this is not how we research near-death experience. 
what you have here is a light bulb at the end of the tunnel. That's a fake near-death kit. Uh, the good news is that's not how we conduct near-death experience research, in spite of the fact that I'm pretty sure skeptics think that's what we do. Anyway, moving on rapidly. I'm going to present nine lines of evidence for the reality of near-death experience and its very consistent message of an afterlife. Number one, of course, is crystal clear consciousness. Now, following a cardiac arrest or heart attack, if you will, uh, it's remarkable to think that near-death experiences can occur here. Immediately when your heart stops beating, of course, blood stops flowing to the brain instantly. The EEG or electroencephalogram, a measure of brain electrical activity, is flat in 10 to 20 seconds. And yet what's observed in near-death experience at this time are the near-death experiences after cardiac arrest. Uh, it, given this, you know, this seemingly impossibility of consciousness during an NDE, it's notable that an indirect survey question asked directly about their degree of consciousness and alertness during their near-death experience. Remarkably, even though they were unconscious or clinically dead, three-fourths stated they were more consciousness and alertness than normal during their NDE, about 20% normal consciousness, and only 5% less consciousness and alertness. Uh, in addition to that crystal clear consciousness during the near-death experience, over and over we've seen that near-death experiences are remembered verbatim years to decades later. It seems to be a very special type of memory occurring during, during near-death experiences, allowing that long-term accurate memory. Well, line of evidence number two is what occurs in out-of-body observations. Now, out-of-body observations occur in my study in about 45% of NDEs. What that means is consciousness separates from the physical body at the time that they are unconscious or clinically dead, typically is the first element of a near-death experience, and it's an out-of-body observation if they can see ongoing earthly events. Well, okay, is what they see of ongoing events real? There's been a couple prospective studies by the Dr. Sabom and Sartori that suggested that what people saw in the out-of-body state was vividly accurate down to the finest details, details they could not possibly have known other than actually seeing it with consciousness apart from the body. Dr. Jan Holden performed a review of the literature on near-death experience and found that 92% of these out-of-body observations were without any apparent inaccuracy whatsoever down to the finest detail among those people, either the near-death experiencer or researcher that later set out to verify the accuracy or inaccuracy of what they saw. And that's astounding. In my INDERF study, we looked at 287 people with OBEs seeing earthly ongoing events during their NDE. About 98% of these out-of-body observations were without any apparent inaccuracy whatsoever as determined either by my review or the near-death experience for themselves. Remarkably, scores of these observations were far from the physical body. Uh, they could be yards to even miles away from the physical body, what they were observing during their NDE, far beyond any possible physical sensory awareness. And that obviously is absolutely medically inexplicable for them to have accurate uh, observations that far from the physical body. And yet we see that over and over. Now, here's an interesting one. Line of evidence number three is visual near-death experiences in the blind. Well, Blindness can vary. You can be born blind or develop blindness later in life, or you can be partly blind or completely blind, but near-death experiences in the blind, including those totally blind from birth, have been reported. These are typical near-death experiences, but they have vision in those blind people. Let's give an example of that for Marta G. Uh, she was a five-year-old blind and unfortunately got away from her parents and ended up in a lake. So in Marta's words, uh, and some of these NDEs have been paraphrased for clarity, but Marta states, I breathed in the lake water and promptly lost consciousness. I was pulled out by a beautiful woman who was dressed in bright white light. She looked into my eyes and asked what I wanted. I was completely satisfied and at first could think of nothing. Finally, it occurred to me that I wanted to take a trip around the lake. In my journey, I saw a detail I would never have been able to see in real life by simply intending. I could go anywhere, even to the tops of trees. I was legally blind. For the first time, I could see leaves on trees, birds feathers, birds eyes, details on telephone poles and people's backyards. That was far more clear 
than 2020 vision. I mean, amazing mundane things like telephone poles, birds, uh, feathers, which we take for granted when you see it for the first time, dramatic. Line of evidence number four, near-death experiences under general anesthesia. Now, under the blanket of sleep of general anesthesia, you should have no conscious lucid recollection, but especially when your heart stops while you're under general anesthesia and you have a near-death experience, I would submit consciousness should be doubly impossible, and yet near-death experiences happen. In my study, I looked at 23 near-death experiences that were convincingly occurring while under general anesthesia. They absolutely occur, and they're typical near-death experiences. In my INDER survey, there are 33 questions pertinent to the NDE elements, or what happened during the NDE. Remarkable between the NDEs occurring under anesthesia and NDEs occurring under all other circumstances, 32 of the 33 elements occurred equally often. The only difference is the near-death experiences under general anesthesia were statistically more likely to see a tunnel. I don't know why that is, but the key question that I alluded to earlier asking about their level of consciousness and alertness was absolutely the same, no statistical difference whether you're under general anesthesia or have near-death experiences under all other circumstances, which almost single-handedly, that observation excludes the possibility that near-death experiences can in any way be due to physical brain function. But after the, the first four lines of evidence, I think a lot of folks say, geez, well, what do the skeptics say? Uh, there's over 20, probably over 30 at this point, different skeptical explanations of near-death experiences. I've heard just about every imaginable physiological, psychological, cultural explanation. Now, you might be asking yourself, geez, why do skeptics have over 20 different explanations? Answer, very simple. Skeptics themselves, as a group, cannot agree on any one or even several explanations of MDE that they propose that they accept as adequately explaining near-death experience. Bottom line, no skeptic argument can explain anything that you're hearing today as a line of evidence let alone the totality of the evidence in my talk, as well as in the many other talks that have gone on throughout this conference. But number five, a line of evidence for the reality of NDE is it's a remarkable worldwide consistency. Jody didn't uh, say this, but she was single-handedly involved in having portions of the Enderf website uh, and the questionnaire translated into over 30 different languages. So that's allowed us to do by far the largest cross-cultural study of near-death experience that's ever been possible. Near-death experiences literally from around the world where people can share in their native tongue, a narrative of their experience and answer the translated survey questions. Bottom line, anywhere in the world you go, near-death experience content is strikingly similar. Now language gets in the way. I mean, shoot, even uh, wherever you are, near-death experiences are often called ineffable or difficult to describe in language. So you can imagine the difficulty in translating complex words like uh, spiritual or unearthly. And so uh, if you uh, take that into account, looking at these near-death experiences shared in non-English languages and translated to English, we have posted on Inter, you can see for yourself how remarkably similar NDEs are. Now, a good research question is, well, what about non-Western countries defined as countries which are not predominantly Judeo-Christian? Once again, based on some research I've done with my collaborating author on this in Iran, uh, it plus my own research of scores of non-Western near-death experiences shared with Ender. Bottom line is, once again, the content appears strikingly similar as far as the deep core content of the near-death experience. I mean, yes, anywhere in the world, they're going to encounter deceased relatives that they knew in their life. They may encounter religious beings from their particular re religion, but the bottom line is the core content of near-death experience, amazingly similar. Uh, the implications are enormous. I mean, think of this, it doesn't seem to make any difference whether you're, say, a Hindu in India or a Muslim in Egypt or a Christian in the United States. Anywhere on earth, near-death experiences occur. The content, what occurs, is going to be remarkably similar. Very strong evidence that literally we, all of us, are spiritual beings having a human experience wherever we are on the planet. But let's look at number six, change lived after effects. How will your lives change after your near-death experience? Uh, shout out to the near-death experiencers in this conference. I'm pretty sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. What happens after a near-death experience is profound, lifelong, 
and has been found in both prospective and retrospective studies, you find many changes after near-death experience. Some of the more typically described ones, increased belief in an afterlife, reduced fear of death, uh, increasingly value loving relationships that become less materialistic and have an increased belief in God. This is straight from my most recent survey, 834 near-death experiences. We asked them about the, their change in compassion after they had a near-death experience. The survey question was written to ask about their compassion toward others first part before my experience, prior to their near-death experience, and oh my gosh, look at that. Only 23.3% were greatly compassionate toward others prior to their near-death experience. Look down below where it says at the current time. This is the time they shared their near-death experience, uh, typically about 15 or more, you know, quite a range, but on average around 15 years later. So after their near-death experience and after they've had time to change from it, Oh my gosh, that greatly compassionate toward others is now up to 77.3%, a whopping increase in what near-death experiencers say is an increase in compassion that they experience following their near-death experience. And here's another one. We ask about the meaning of uh, life after, uh, during, after their near-death experience. What, is the, what about the meaning and significance of our earthly lives? Well, again, from near death, the same group of 834 near-death experiencers, uh, they ask, what about the, uh, before your experience, I believe your earthly life was, it was only 27.5% uh, thought it was meaningful and significant. And uh, after looking down at the current time, after their near-death experience, an amazing increase to 80.4%. So again, a whopping increase in the belief of the meaning and significance of our earthly lives. And I would submit, I can't think of any other single earthly life events that has such a profound change in both the level of compassion and belief in the meaning and significance of our earthly life. But moving on, line of evidence number seven, straight up, you want to find out if near-death experience is real? Great. Uh, the prior version of the Ender survey, there were 1,122 people who had a near-death experience. And I asked, I had the question is, how do you currently view the reality of your experience? And these are the four options. These are the people that have had their near-death experience. And again, straight from into ears, amazing, 95.5% selected that their experience was definitely real. Less than 5% thought it was probably real, and good gosh, less than a half a percent, either probably not real or definitely not real. So if you ask the near-death experiencers themselves, they are convinced the overwhelming majority of the definite reality of their experience. And I would submit, again, out of respect for people's ability to generally understand reality, if skeptics want to represent that NDEs are not real, they, the skeptics, should present strong evidence that NDEs are not real. They can't. They don't have a leg to stand on. And as noted, they can't explain any of the, the evidence we're presenting here or has been presented throughout this conference. Now, here's an interesting one, too. These are shared near-death experiences. These are two or more people having a simultaneous life-threatening event. That means at the same time, they were unconscious or clinically dead and had a near-death experience. But they are aware of each other during their near-death experience. Hence, it's called a shared near-death experience. These remarkable near-death experiences, we've investigated 15 of them. But no question about that, shared near-death experiences do occur. And they are typical NDEs in terms of typical content, but with that remarkable shared component, shared with another person also having a near-death experience. And this is illustrated when William shared his comments, uh, shared near-death experience. I was in the car taking my girlfriend to her parents' home in Welland. I fell asleep while driving. I then realized that we were out of our bodies and flying quickly upwards while holding hands. We flew straight up for about a minute. We then saw a park or countryside-like landscape. Suddenly, we were encountered for, with four creatures. Two flanked each of us, and they began to separate us gently. They overwhelmed us with a feeling of the highest love and compassion beyond anything we could experience on Earth. We were feeling a divine love. Therefore, we did not resist their effort. 
I felt sort of like a baby in a mother's arms, although it's hard to describe accurately. Two of the creatures moved her upward toward the distant landscape and two moved me back downward. I felt so much love, peace, and comfort that I wanted to protest and say, no, please let me stay here. But I heard inwardly or psychically that I couldn't stay. Next, I saw my car in flames from about a quarter mile up above. I felt a falling sensation and awakened in the car. The front was on fire. I moved her from leaning on me as she was when I fell asleep, knowing that her body was only an empty shell. I had left her above with the beings, and indeed, she was dead. And this was her shared near-death experience, straight from William, very dramatic. In some of my latest research, I've sort of looked further here. I think it should be obvious now from this and other research presented, is there an, a an afterlife? Well, the answer from a mountain of evidence is an unequivocal yes. Well, I and I'm sure many other people are curious of the fact that if there is an afterlife, and we know that, what can we learn about it from near-death experiences? Unfortunately, the answer is we can learn a great deal. So let's talk about that. There's really, uh, at least for the purpose of this presentation, three of the big questions that's been on humanity's minds literally for millennia, thousands of years. Uh, and yet information in near-death experiences addresses the concepts of love, God, and unity. It addresses these three concepts with tremendously consistent information about what that's all about. So again, let's go straight to love. Interestingly, in a very recent article in the Journal of Near-Death Studies, we had a person who we worked with who looked at over 500 near-death experiences on the INDIRF website, looked at sequentially shared near-death experiences, and they sought out the most common words that described what in the near-death experiencers' words, what occurred during the near-death experience. The two most common words were light and love. So again, showing how critical love is in near-death experiences and how important it is to people having near-death experiences. So what, what can we learn about love and near-death experiences? Well, in the most recent survey, I found that encountering, this is a, a most recent version of the end of survey, uh, inf encountering information about love and near-death experiences is way more common than I would have guessed. From the 834 people we surveyed, we asked a question straight up during your experience. And we made it in the context of this question, their experience, their near-death experience, not at any other time during their life. So during your experience, did you encounter any specific information or awareness regarding love? Wow, 57.1% answered yes, uh, and another 8% uncertain. So fascinating that such a high percentage of people having near-death experiences believe they encountered specific information regarding love during their near-death experience. Uh, now, a text box response followed this question and that allowed them to put into narrative form what insights and awareness they were encountering regarding love. And that was, as you were soon to see, extremely revealing. So these are direct quotes from near-death experiencers about the love they encountered. I knew that love was the greatest force around us and that we are all love and love is the only thing that is real. Love was everywhere. It permeated the afterlife. It was incredible. I was loved unconditionally despite my faults and fears. The entire experience was one of unfathomable love. Okay, folks, that's four quotes from near-death experiencers about love. But we have gone to the effort of having hundreds of these descriptions, all of the narrative responses in the aforementioned question on the end of survey about love. You can literally read them for yourself on that screen survey. And you can see for yourself the overwhelmingly powerful, unearthly descriptions of love that are so consistently seen in near-death experience, now times hundreds, evidence that is absolutely irrefutable. Okay, what about God in near-death experiences? Well, again, I looked through 866 sequentially shared near-death experiences. This was different from the 
a research article published in the recent Journal of, Journal of Near-Death Studies. But look at that, just like the finding of that investigator, light and love in that order were the two most common words that were identified. The third most common word that near-death experiencers use to describe what happened during the near-death experience, there's God. And I will tell you, as someone who's done over 20 years of near-death experience research, I'm amazed that there isn't much more research ongoing about some of the most critical common words that near-death experiencers use to describe their experience, light, love, and God. Uh, I hope to see a lot more research on these important concepts, certainly important to the near-death experiencers themselves in the future. So once again, encountering God in near-death experiences is common from the 834 surveyed in our latest version of the Inverse survey, I asked during your experience, again, emphasizing your death experience, did you encounter any specific information or awareness that God or a supreme being does or does not exist? And the yes was a remarkably high 48.0%. I want to emphasize that I added that or does not portion of the question to help satisfy, I think, a reasonable concern that if you ask just simply the question straight up, you would be overlooking people that found information that God does not exist during their near-death experience. But as you'll note at the bottom there, again, we had a text box response following this question, and it was very clear that essentially everybody that said yes to that question were responding in the sense that yes, they encountered information or awareness that God or a supreme being does exist. It's remarkable to have that high of a percentage of people uh, coming up with awareness of God or supreme being in their near-death experience. So let's talk about God from the point of view of the near-death experience. This is the actual indie ear descriptions. God is everything, energy, the fabric of everything. You know it is a supreme being by the all-encompassing love and warmth within and outside of you, all around you and through you, in every part, in every moment. I did not believe in God before my experience. The presence of God, the forms in which God presented itself to me were undeniable. I wasn't just given information, I experienced the information so I would absolutely know it to be true. I wanna emphasize here in the text box response to the question about God, over and over again, we heard from people that would say things like, God is not an adequate word. God is an earthly word. What I encountered is beyond words, beyond anything on earth. So God is simply used as a term of convenience, something that's recognized by other people. And yet uh, very, very commonly, we had near-death experiencers state God is, as a term is inadequate for that overwhelming being of love, light, uh, and, and basically of everything that they encountered during the near-death experience. So you know, please be aware of that as we talk about God in near-death experience. One of the most common things people describe about when they encounter God is the love of God. So again, from near-death experiencers, no human can ever love the love I felt in that light. It is all consuming, all forgiving, nothing matches it. It is like the day you looked into the eyes of your child for the first time, magnified a million times, indescribable. It wasn't just that I felt unbelievable love, I was unbelievable love. God is love, and that God was within me and all of us. And the entire encounter was about God, the ultimate power of God, God's forgiveness. The message was, love is the greatest power in the universe. So these are just a few quotes here that, out of necessity for the time of this presentation. But again, we've uh, got all the narrative responses that talk about God, hundreds of descriptions of God in that URL for those that are interested. Uh, three or four quotes is certainly intriguing, but by the time you see hundreds and hundreds of people describing God remarkably consistently uh, in, in ways like the quotes I'm presenting, uh, that becomes overwhelmingly powerful evidence that the God encountered in near-death experiences uh, certainly seems to be uh, a, a very real God indeed. Let's talk about Another third spiritual concept, that being unity. Well, encounter, interestingly, once again, encountering information about a universal connection and oneness in near-death experiences 
is common. So here's the 834 indie years surveyed in the latest version. And my question was, during your experience, did you encounter any specific information or awareness that a mystical universal connection or unity oneness either does or does not exist? A whopping 47.1% answering yes to that question about encountering unity or oneness. As with the God question, the text box response following this question made it crystal clear that essentially everybody said yes to the question, responding yes in the sense that they did encounter information or awareness that a universal connection or oneness does exist. A remarkably high percentage of near-death experiencers saying yes. So again, let's talk a little bit about what that means when they encounter that unity or oneness. So here are quotes from near-death experiencers, the text box responses to the aforementioned question. I was aware of a oneness, a connection with God and all the other souls, but also an individuality. We are each pieces of a greater whole as I understand it. And getting back where we can all be together again is the ultimate going home. I felt a universal connection or unity, but it didn't really seem mystical at the time. It just felt like this is how it is. Intriguing. Uh, interestingly, unity or a oneness with God is commonly described in near-death experiences for illustration purposes from into ears, direct quotes. I did not see God with eyes, but God was everything and everywhere. There was no separation felt in the experience. There was no religious God. There seemed to be a supreme being, though I felt we are all a part of that being. And we are all one. One is God. The separation of one to two is life. Once again, these are some illustrative quotes, but you can literally see hundreds of these types of description of oneness and unity described in near-death experience from that URL there. Again, overwhelmingly powerful evidence that people, you know, times hundreds of people having near-death experiences are aware of uh, remarkably consistently describing that unity which is amazing. Well, I think we can say in conclusion here that there are multiple converging lines of evidence, all pointing to the concept that near-death experiences are, in a word, real. And they have that very consistent mass message of an afterlife. And we have some ideas about what that, it's important in near-death experiences about what that afterlife is all about. We have, of course, the strength of multiple lines of evidence of these alternative or so-called skeptical explanations, as noted, can't explain any of this, let alone all of this. So the evidence of an afterlife and, and of that life beyond is a profound message of hope and inspiration. And I think that's really the most important part of my research is the message that death is not the end, but a beginning, a wonderful beginning. And certainly there is a wonderful afterlife for all of us. And I think the concept of an afterlife and something about it is among the most powerful and positive messages conceivable for all of humanity. Thank you very much for your interest.